Hi, good afternoon, and I'm honored to get to speak about a passion of mine. Um, it's high, it's uh, health care delivery and the way it's going to be in the future. So we're going to do things in the next few years that's going to change everything. Um, and so the definition of uh, distributed network is the specific location arrangement of continuing or suggestive objects or events in space or time, particularly think about space and time, or the extent of ramifying structures such as an artery or nerve and its branches. So think about a branching tree-like structure or the geographic range of an organism or disease. So that's gonna be important as I begin to talk further about the system. So why does healthcare have to change? You know, it's, it's fine, isn't it? It makes a lot of money for everybody, everybody's happy. Well, it's really expensive. You can look at this, um, uh, this graph of uh, the US spending on healthcare. This is us, and this is the rest of the world. And this is percent of the gross national product. And so we're hovering around 17, 18%. It's supposed to go to 19% in the next few years of all spending in the US. Okay, and you say, well, okay, Dr. Larry, that's a lot of money, but we must be getting really, really good care for that. And the answer, not as much as you might think. This is a graph that shows the life expectancy in years, and this is the, the spending on each individual per year. And it's $8,000 per individual in the U.S., and our life expectancy is way down here at 78 compared to... Japan, Korea, and most of the European countries. And so life expectancy is probably a good, pretty good endpoint for healthcare, right? So, and this just shows in raw dollars how much we're, we're spending. This is uh, 2.3 trillion in eight. Now it's gonna hit about 3.4 trillion this year. And this shows, again, the projection of uh, total spending of our production in the U.S up in 2022 to at least 20 percent, uh, uh, if unless something changes. And so this is our state, and this is Medicare spending versus the quality of care. In the bottom of the graph, it's rating by government agencies in terms of quality, and this is the spending per capita. And you can see Wisconsin has the overall highest do uh, quality for money. And this is Arkansas, and of course, Louisiana is way up here, very expensive and, and not so good. And fortunately for us, Mississippi is always below us, thank God, <laughs> Mississippi. <laughs> Figuratively and literally. So. And so Donald Berkowitz um, was the director of the Institute for Healthcare Improvement, and he later became the CMS director, which is Medicare and Medicaid for the U.S., and it sets kind of policy for the entire nation. And you can see here, Dr. Bergwitz said, for us to improve health care in America, we have to do uh, three things. One is we have to improve the experience of the patient in, in the, as they contact the health care delivery system. So do patients like health care or not? We have to improve the health of the population, so all the members of our population. And we have to reduce the per capita spending in health care because we can't continue to spend more and more money on health care without making significant improvements. And so I'm going to show you the most expensive element in health care, and that's me. I would have put a picture of me up there, but I didn't look um, angry enough to, to, to be this individual. But, but we control all the spending in health care, this individual, the doctor. And while we don't deliver all the health care, we write all the checks, we write all the orders, and we kind of direct the health care delivery. And the way we pay for health care instructs me to spend as much money as I possibly can. The more things I spend, the more money I make, the more money the hospital makes. And so we've got to move away from volume spending and make sure we spend money in a valuable way to put the patient first, right? So Albert Einstein said, insanity is doing the same thing over and over again, expecting different results, you know? And in healthcare, uh, that's kind of what we do over and over again. We say, well, we're just gonna try to cut the spending. We're not changing anything we're gonna do. We're gonna pay in the same way. And that's not gonna cut it. And so. What we really have to do is think about the patient. We gotta do what's right for the patient, ultimately. We gotta put ourselves in the role of the patient and think about what I wanna do for my family, my family's in the audience here, what I want my family to do, and that's the way we ought to be directing healthcare. And so how nature works is the kind of the title of this talk. And if you think about this tree in the background, it's a, it starts with a big trunk and it goes down to smaller and smaller branches and eventually you get down to the level of the leaves and the leaves are the individual patient. 
And this pattern you'll see over and over again in nature. I'm an OBGYN physician, and I'm a sub-subspecialist in maternal fetal medicine, which is high-risk OB. Okay, so, and, so this is a placenta. This is the beginning of life. And you can see that same tree-like branching structure I showed you in the other. This is a cartoon. Here's the actual photomicrograph, and I think it's easy for you to see the branches of the tree here. And the blood from the mother comes in and bathes this branching, branching tree-like fetus, and that's how, we, that's how we nourish the fetus as it develops. You can see this in this structure. This is a single neuron but this in your brain, and this neuron is connected to other neurons, and the other neurons are connected to form units, and that's how your brain is formed. So it's a branching tree-like structure. Okay, now, um, this, this is my son. And this is the most famous Lowry in Arkansas right now. He played for the Arkansas Razorbacks, and he's a sub-subspecialist. He's a middle-inning relief pitcher. He's not a starting pitcher. He's not a closer. He's a middle-inning relief pitcher. That's when they put him in the middle of the game, when the bases are loaded, and uh, Ellen, my wife, and I would go to these games, and we would feel like we were on the field with Jackson, and, and we were all nude in front of the stadium. That's the way we felt when he... <laughs> He would go into the game. So, but, but he got through it. Imagine this if the coach said, Jackson, I don't really care where you play. You just go and play anywhere. You can play second base if you feel like it a day, and uh, you can hit. You don't have to really worry about pitching. Well, that's kind of like health care today. We, we kind of get to do what we want to, and we don't have a systematic, really, approach to the way we're going to deliver care. So the truth of the matter, the coach tells everybody where to go, and he tells Who's gonna, he says, who's going to pitch? And, and so it's a systematic approach to deliver. And if you do that, you can end up winning, right? So this is the team when they won um, in Fayetteville, beat uh, Missouri State, and got to go to the World Series. And everybody was really happy. This is my son. And, you know, they work as a team. And the teams are dependent on one another. And everybody has a role in the team. And they do their role. And if you do that, that's, that's the way to win and be efficient. Okay, so I'm going to show you what we've done in high-risk OB at the University of Arkansas for Medical Sciences. So a long time ago, we started thinking about this, and we said that we have to do things differently. Okay, so I'm a maternal fetal medicine, and I told you that, that I'm very knowledgeable in taking care of pregnant women and sick fetuses, babies. There are OBGYN guys that are general OBGYN guys, um, and we train these guys at the school, and they function at this level. And this, the next level, is the uh, family practitioner and RNs and APNs that function at another level. And then you talk about patient care techs, even diabetic educators, genetic counselors that are part of this structure. And then finally, the patients in the system. So the high-risk experts begin to set the tone and the guidelines and protocols for doing this. But what's been lacking to this point is a nervous system. And technology then becomes our nervous system and allows us to, to connect to people and individuals and even the patients across time and space, like I said at the beginning. So medic, you say in the state of Arkansas, we're hugely underserved. If you look at this map, this is blue is underserved and red is underserved. And so pretty much the entire state is underserved. And so it's one of the big problems in the state, and many rural uh, states like this, there's just not enough doctors and subspecialists to go around. There are not enough sub-subspecialists that can come in and troubleshoot and live in this area to be able to do this. But we can bring them to the area through technology, and that's what we're doing. And fortunately for us, we're in the center of the state, and that makes a lot of things easier. We have um, uh, high bandwidth lines going all over the state and as part of the, one of the programs we started we put, spent $102 million to build a robust network throughout the state that allows us to do video conferencing and deliver care across the state in high risk OB and we're beginning to apply this into other aspects of health care. So by making an, an efficient system what we can then begin to do is increase production of the system because now I can work 100% of my time as a high-risk obstetrician caring for patients in the state no matter where they live. Before, I was limited geographically only to the city of Little Rock and the region to provide care. So it opens up a whole new ball game. We can also cut production costs because I figure I'm more efficient in doing managing some of the high-risk patients than people with less knowledge. And we can improve safety, obviously, because we can apply our knowledge across the state wherever the patient, anytime, anywhere, and any need. 
And so we do this by uh, connecting the system, right? So we connect traditional healthcare consults. So I'm doing consults in high-risk OB as though I did it in person. I'll show you that in a minute. We can do remote care. We can put devices on patients and monitor the patients. And we can use now apps and cell phones to do a lot of things we couldn't do before. And we do individual, but now also population-based health care. And the payment structure is going to force us to do more of this. As we move forward, we get paid less and less for each in-person visit. So we're going to have to do things to drive down the cost, but yet still maintain the quality of health care. And we can do this. We can, we can maximize health care resources. We can maximize maternal fetal medicine throughout the state and other specialties. We can increase opportunities to engage other clinicians so they become part of the team, like the baseball team I demonstrated before. Patients can self-manage that care. This is very important because now you can help in managing yourself, manage your diabetes, manage in your high-risk pregnancy, those sort of things. And we can use technology available to consumers to deliver patient care outside of the hospital or doctor's office. A little while ago, I was talking about could we do obstetrical visits by iPads from the mother's homes, and I think we can, you know, particularly in routine patients. So that would be convenient and less expensive than coming to the doctor. I don't think there's, is there anybody in here that likes to go sit in the doctor's office for two hours and wait to see the doctor? I don't, there's not a single person raising their hand, so, and I don't think you'll find anybody. So technology becomes our nervous system, like I said. And so evolution, it, um, uh, Charles Darwin said, it's not the strongest of the species that survives, nor the most intelligent that survives. It is the one that is most adaptable to change. And so if we're going to survive in this changing world, we're going to have to adapt. Think about Amazon.com. You know, who would have thought that that would have supplanted the brick and mortar stores? But it is. Health care is going to have to do the same thing. This is Jennifer's story. So this is an example of what we do. Have you ever heard the words telehealth or telemedicine and wondered what they meant? Maybe it's a new kind of medical telephone or some new TV show about a hospital. Instead of trying to define these terms, it's best to describe what they mean with stories about real people. Meet Jennifer. Jennifer is five months pregnant and lives in a rural area in the American South. At one of her first doctor's visits, Jennifer was told that her pregnancy could be high risk. She would be monitored more closely than most pregnant women. This means more doctor's visits, more tests, more traveling from her small town, and more time away from work and family. All of this adds up to more money. Now meet Dr. Allen. Dr. Allen works at a regional health clinic 15 minutes away from Jennifer's home. Dr. Allen is a family practice physician and sees all types of patients. Dr. Allen isn't specialized in high-risk pregnancies, but there's a tool at his office that can help Jennifer and her family. The tool is a video conferencing unit. Video conferencing allows two people to communicate in real time over long distances. Sounds like a telephone, huh? Yes, but video adds the face-to-face -face element that a phone cannot offer. Video conferencing also allows users to send high-resolution medical images back and forth in real time. Okay, back to Jennifer. She has an appointment to see her doctor in the capital city of her state, which is two and a half hours away. Instead of missing work, finding babysitters, filling the car up with gas, and maybe even staying in a hotel, Jennifer can drive to her regional health clinic and see her doctor in Capital City over live video. The doctor can see Jennifer, look at ultrasound images, and direct her care with the help of health care workers by Jennifer's side. All this is accomplished by video conferencing equipment and high-speed internet lines. Jennifer doesn't have to take time away from work or time away from her family. Jennifer gets more specialized care, cheaper and faster. That's telemedicine. So imagine that that's the future of health care, not just in high-risk OB, but in everything. Okay, so in addition to this, we have, um, we run this like a, a clinic, um, like a live clinic. So we have a nurse assigned to the clinic. We see patients interactively over the video conferencing. And I appear before the patient and talk to the patient as though the patient were in the center. So um, this shows... As part of this uh, program, we also put together a 24-hour coordination center in which we have nurses that man the phones and patients call in, other doctors call in and talk to us across the network and we manage their care. So we manage transports, we answer questions for patients, and so we run a 24-hour operation um, with uh, personnel. And through th so this call center, which is a, a vital part of what we do, 
It handles 17,829 phone calls and 20, 211 uh, OB transports per, per 2014. And you can see the other um, urgent care visits by this. So by having patients call the center and talk to a nurse on call, we avoided them going to the ER 1,567 times. And so the, what's the impact that this had on Arkansas? We increased the visits to the, the um, um, early pregnant, there we go. The more high-risk mothers were diagnosed early in the pregnancy, then more preterm infants were born in hospitals with neonatologists. Next one, neonatal mortality rates have declined, and mothers from rural areas are more, uh, more likely to deliver high-risk babies at UAMS. And finally, AHRQ, which is a national organization named uh, Our Angels, which is this program, OBGYN telemedicine model for the nation. And so this shows all the angel sites we have around the state. These are actually virtual functioning clinics for which we see patients every week to provide high-risk OB care to these patients. And so as we started the program back in 2003, um, the model is now plug and play. So we add other things to it, like the telemedicine setup, the call center setup, and we're beginning to add other things like we added Peds Place, um, which is right there, and uh, diabetes telecolposcopy, resident facilitated high risk OB clinic, Spanish translation interpreters, stroke, the, the Arkansas SAFE program, which you may have heard about as part of this stroke assistance through virtual emergency support. We're treating patients through, uh, from UAMS around the state in the ERs, and then adult sickle cell disease, HIV, hand trauma. We have uh, doctors on call at UMS with, that have iPads, and when there's a tr hand trauma that comes in an ER somewhere, they call our call center, we link the hand surgeon up to that ER. The hand surgeon looks at the, patient, the hand in the ER and, and then makes decisions about what needs to happen to the patient. So spinoff company, Angel Eyes, one of the companies, Angel Eyes, a company that, um, that we have that puts a, a, a camera over the baby and the, the parents can go home and then look over the internet and see their baby in the nursery after they've left the hospital, you know, sometimes they have to leave their baby behind for three or four uh, months, you know, at a time. So they, they worry about their baby, so it's reassuring. This, these are wearables, and now the next phase of this stuff is being putting uh, wearables on the patient that allow us to monitor them from home. The, the data comes in, and we monitor them and make decisions based on the data. And this, you can see, these are uh, devices. This is a chip that's put on that monitors um, basically chemistry. This can monitor glucose. This is a contact lens. Wearable devices that can put on patients. And of course, this is a, an eye watch. And everybody wants to have an e-bra. So this is a bra <laughs> with embedded sensors that, that monitor your physiology. And so this is a very efficient system, better management of chronic diseases, shared health professional staffing reduced travel times, fewer or shorter hospital stays. And the physician of the past has been individuals working alone in the darkness. Now we're working as teams involving physician assistants, pharmacists, APNs, nurses, paramedics, nursing assistants, and lay health care workers as teams that communicate across the system. And these are some of the connections that we, we, we built around the state when we got the BTOP money for $102 million. We spent this, and these are all the connections. Soon there'll be thousands of more connections off each node from smartphones and smart devices that will be connected into the system as well. And so across the spectrum of disease from the very beginning, from pregnancy all the way to geriatrics, and this shows my son, in case anybody wants to know where he is, he's pitching for the Toronto Blue Jays, and I warn you that you'll see a subspecialist like Jackson in your community real soon providing you know, additional support to your practitioners. So uh, that's it, angels. So, thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. I love my Ebra. It's <laughs> great. So, how soon before we see mass adoption across multiple disciplines within the healthcare field of this type of technology in Arkansas? Well, we we help Senator Bledsoe get a law passed now paying for telemedicine, which will start in January of next year, and I think that'll help a lot as we begin to now pay for value, insurance companies and other systems pay for value and not volume, mm -hmm. then you'll pick up these things. I was just in a meeting yesterday where 
Um, Thomas Jefferson University in Philadelphia is a very prominent, it's rated like the 12th best medical school in America. And they're, they're saying that that's the future. They're not going to build a lot more buildings. They're going to go to virtual health care. And so I think people are beginning to pick it up now. We have the structure to be able to do this wholesale real soon, and the school is now beginning to adopt this as a, a direction that it wants to move in to. But we're already doing a lot at the school now, you know, with stroke and burns and trauma wow. and that kind of stuff. So. So what are some of the challenges that we face with, with reaching that mass adoption and what are some of the outcomes that we're seeing, positive outcomes we're seeing right now that will help accelerate that process and improve our healthcare system? Well, you know, mo most of the doctors leading healthcare systems are old guys and so they're less likely to adopt <laughs> things. So that's, that's an obstacle. But I, I think as they begin to see a handwriting on the wall with funding change, then we begin to do that kind of stuff. The consumers are adopting it really fast. So the consumers are going to drive we'll this drive largely, that market. just like right. just like with Amazon.com and those right. sort of things. And they want they don't want to sit in the waiting room. They want to be able to call up the doctor or visit the doctor by video online and talk to them and get treatment of some sort or avoid going to the ER, which is something that's really forcing. There's a lot of companies being formed around the nation that are beginning to provide those services. Unfortunately, they're disconnected from the traditional health care system. And I think that's very bad because what happens, you just create another silo that, that spends money and doesn't really necessarily be held accountable for outcomes. So we need to embed it in what we're doing and make that more efficient. Virtual reality and augmented reality. Um, are there any projects that you're aware of right now that are stepping beyond maybe just a simple mobile device like an iPad or an iPhone or an Android? Um, are there any technologies that are in development to, to bring that to, to bear on this solution? Well, not, not so much in direct patient care delivery, but in education big time in what we do to educate medical school students and surgeons. There are uh, things like um, surgeons who can train on virtual approaches to the kind of surgery they're going to do so they're prepared for things. And, right. And we're running simulations so now. In the education space, the healthcare right, we're space. We're doing simulations now using systems. And, right. and we, we, we do a thing at university where we send our, we have these mannequin simulators and we can send them out in the field. <laughs> and what we're doing is they're in the field and then our people critique the physicians from here of how they're doing. We're getting ready to do a pilot where the physician would be in another place. We'd have our personnel in the in our uh, simulation area and that physician will run the code for instance from their hospital right. so that's cheaper and better because the doctor doesn't have to leave work and and you save a lot of money by taking that approach so there are a lot of things like that that you can do that will really change things um, we're getting ready to start a project next week on virtual rounding of which the um, the doctors will round on a for instance a pregnant woman and and the will film it you know, film the encounter, that'll be stored in a secure site, and a family member then can access that cine loop, that video, and find out what the hell the doctor told <laughs> the patient for <laughs> once, which families struggle with that, or they're getting discharged. Transparency. Yeah, they're transparent. They're getting discharged, and they want to know how to care of the wound, and they can't remember the 50 things that we told them. They can, it'll be filmed, and you can go and look at it online and say, well, oh, that's how I need to treat my wound, Recall. so that kind right. of stuff. Yeah, I think awesome. that's hugely beneficial. So. I, absolutely. I think this has the, the, the possibility to really change quality of life and even lifespans in just the next 10 years. I appreciate your work on well, that. Well, anybody that says it's not going to happen, just look at the books. Books. How many people? Right. You know, the book uh, sellers are in jeopardy right, right. now uh, uh, because there's more... Um, uh, virtual books, you know, from uh, Kindle sold now than live. Right. So, right. It, you know, it's unfortunate, but that's the way it goes. It is what it is. It is what we it is. We have a bright future. Right. Thank you, Doctor. Thank you. Thank you very Appreciate much. Appreciate you very much.